Hello humans! Today we're going to explore the question that has haunted horror movie fans and Halloween enthusiasts for ages. Is it really possible to be scared to death? First, let's take a few minutes to talk about the science of fear itself. Fear is a natural response to the perceived threat or danger that surrounds you. It triggers our body's fight-or-flight response, which prepares us to either confront the danger or to run away to safety. Now, when we experience fear, our body releases an entire cocktail of hormones, including adrenaline, cortisol, and others that cause our heart rate to increase, our muscles to tense, and our senses to sharpen. Now, personally, I find this fascinating in and of itself. It's like all of us are kind of like going through our everyday life, but if you're startled or if you have an immediate presence and sense of danger around you, then you can just feel your body changing instantly. Your heart starts to race and you start to get kind of a hyper awareness of everything around you. That has happened to me before in the woods where I thought I heard something, an animal or something right behind me, and immediately you go into hyperdrive mode. All of your hearing, your sight, everything gets hyper-focused for a split second. Of course, your heart starts racing. Why do you think that happens? It's because you're getting ready to run. If your heart starts racing, you're circulating more blood, more liters per second throughout your body. And so when the increased breathing that comes along with running, your body is ready to take on the extra oxygen circulating around your body to power your muscles. And it's kind of amazing because this whole hyper-awareness, this whole adrenaline thing, it lasts a few minutes at most, and then obviously your body cannot run on adrenaline forever. You get exhausted and you have to slow down and stop. But the whole idea here is that hopefully those two or three minutes you have of like superhuman strength is enough to get away from whatever is chasing you or about to get you. Now here's a question for you. Did you know that the fight or flight response is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system in your body, which is like the body's superhero headquarters for lack of a better word? The sympathetic nervous system is what sends out signals to the rest of your body telling it to get ready for action. Now when the fight or flight response is actually triggered, large amounts of adrenaline and cortisol is released into your body. These hormones help to increase your blood pressure and your breathing rate and even your heart rate, giving you the energy and the strength we need to face the danger and make a quick getaway. One interesting fact is that the fight or flight response is an evolutionary adaptation that helped our ancestors survive in the wild. It's like a built-in survival mechanism that's been passed down through the generations. You know, people sometimes ask me, well, if evolution is actually a thing, it seems very, very complex. How could that have evolved from simpler beings? Like, how could that have happened? Well, here's how you need to look at it. You have two populations of proto-humans. These are sort of like not humans, but whatever existed before us in the evolutionary history. All right, one population of them uh, doesn't have any fight or flight response at all. There's no cortisol, there's no adrenaline, there's nothing to trigger extra heart rate or anything like that. But then there's another population that has had uh, mutations in their DNA and they have evolved the idea and the systems to, to, to secrete the adrenaline and the cortisol and a fight or flight response has been developed. So if you have these two parallel populations and if they existed at the same time on Earth, what do you think would happen? Well, over time, the population without any fight or flight response would get eaten, right? Because tigers, lions, other animals would come into their, you know, into their camp and just slaughter them. They would have no ability to get away. And then, of course, the other population of proto-humans or whatever existed before would survive statistically longer, long enough to mate and reproduce. So the two parallel populations, obviously the one with the fight or flight response, statistically would be able to pass on their genes. And that is how very complex systems that really help us survive gets passed down through the generations. But nowadays, we're not really fighting lions and tigers and, 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 and large animals in the wild. We get nervous when we stand in front of people and talk because everyone's looking at us and we get sweaty palms and we start to have the, the hair on the back of our neck stand up. Or maybe if you're going to a job interview and you have to think of the right words. So all of those things that we feel as stress, those are actually fight or flight responses to danger. It's just that the dangers that we have today are quite different than what we faced in the past. 
I can speak for personal experience on this. You know, everybody has stress in their life. It's really difficult to do when you feel like you have no time, but it's really important for all of us to take, even if it's just a few minutes a day and go for a walk or a few minutes a day to tell everybody to go away from you and to sit in a room and get some quiet by yourself. Because sometimes if we can just do that, then we can kind of calm down and help us to be able to tackle whatever else is being thrown at us during the day. Now back to the question at hand. I want you to imagine that you're watching a horror movie. A killer just jumps out of the shadows. Now immediately your heart starts pounding, your palms get sweaty, you might even let out a scream. You know, did you know that the fear response is so powerful it can even temporarily override the body's need for oxygen? That's why you might gasp or hold your breath when you're scared. You know, when you think about it, it kind of doesn't make much sense that when you're scared, you might hold your breath because you actually need more oxygen to think clearly, to run, and all of those things. But that fear response can be temporarily so powerful that it can override your body's need for oxygen, temporarily pause your breathing. We've all experienced that. And then eventually <gasps> you gasp for breath and then you're on your way with your fight or flight response. So let's take a look at some real life examples of people who have reportedly died from fear. Now in 2009, a 40 year old man in Germany suffered a heart attack and died after watching the horror movie, The Twilight Zone. In 2014, a 17-year-old girl in the United States died after being scared by a prank involving a fake spider. Now here's the catch, and this is really the cornerstone of what we're trying to say. It's not really the fear itself that kills these people. Instead, it's the intense psychological response to fear that can lead to heart attacks, strokes, or other medical emergencies. In other words, it's not the emotion of fear that actually kills, but it's the body's reaction to it. Since we're talking about hearts and heart attacks, here's a side note for you. The human heart beats around 100,000 times per day, pumping about 2,000 gallons of blood. That's enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool in just one year. That's what your heart can do. Now that we've discussed being literally scared to death and the science behind fear, let's dive into the topic of heart attacks because it's a relevant topic here. A heart attack, also known as a myocardial infarcation, is a serious medical emergency that occurs when blood flow to the heart is blocked, usually by the buildup of plaque in the coronary arteries. Now, this plaque is made up of cholesterol, fat, and other substances that can narrow the arteries and reduce the blood flow to the heart. And a heart, of course, as you know, is a muscle itself and it needs oxygen and blood flow. So when the heart doesn't get enough blood, so it doesn't get enough oxygen in that case, and it doesn't get enough nutrients that it needs to function properly. This leads to damage or death on the part of the heart muscle. That really is what a heart attack is. Now, heart attacks can be caused by a variety of factors, including genetics, that's a big one, lifestyle choices, you know, how, how much food you eat, how much fat you eat, and things like that, and also lots of underlying medical conditions. There are some common risk factors for heart attacks, which include smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, and a sedentary lifestyle. The bottom line is we all need to get off the couch and do some more exercise to really mitigate the chances of having a heart attack. So now that we know what a heart attack is and how it's caused, let's talk about some of the symptoms and how to prevent them. Now these symptoms are different for everybody, but some common symptoms to watch out for include the following. The first big one is chest discomfort in general. This can feel like a pressure or a squeezing or a pain in the center of the chest. It might last for a few minutes. It might come and go. It might last for longer periods of time. Also, shortness of breath, where you feel like you just can't breathe. You might feel like you can't catch your breath even when you're not doing anything strenuous. Also, upper body discomfort in general. Pain or discomfort in the arms, in the back, in the neck, in the jaw can also be signs of a heart attack. Another symptom is actually nausea and cold sweats. Feeling sick to your stomach or breaking out in a cold sweat, that can also be a sign of a heart attack. And if you're having all of these at once, definitely get into a hospital. So now that you know the signs of a heart attack, what should you do if you're having a heart attack? Here are some steps to follow. The number one thing to do is just call an ambulance. In the United States, you dial 911. In other countries, you call your local emergency number. Don't hesitate, just do it. Who cares how much the ambulance costs? You're going to only live once, you need to take care of it. 
Also, sit down and rest. If you're not already sitting, find a place to sit down and stay calm. If you have an aspirin lying around, you can go ahead and take that. Take a regular strength aspirin. This can help thin your blood and reduce the risk of a heart attack. Lastly, just stay and wait for help. Stay on the line with emergency services, wait for help to arrive. Don't try to drive to the hospital, don't try to be a hero. You sit down and you wait for the ambulance to arrive. So getting back to the main question, what can we do to protect ourselves from being literally scared to death? Well, one way we said before is to manage stress, practice relaxation techniques such as deep breathing, meditation. If you're into yoga, go ahead and do your yoga, that's fine too. These activities can help lower our overall stress level and make us less likely to experience an extreme fight or flight response when we're scared. Now I'll go ahead and say that these people that were scared to death, this is a very, very rare occurrence. And it's almost certainly because some sort of pre-existing condition was happening with the person. That person might have had heart disease and didn't know it. That person may have had blockages in their arteries and did not know it. It would be extremely rare for a fight or flight response and a release of adrenaline, cortisol, and these other things to just cause a heart attack. Our bodies are designed to, to deal with a fight or flight response and to be scared. That's, that's how we were evolutionarily brought up. So I don't want you to be scared to watch movies or frightened that you're going to have a heart attack, right? It's almost always some sort of pre-existing condition that leads to this kind of thing. Now, what can we do to, to kind of mitigate that? As we said, let's try to exercise more. Let's try to get more sleep. Let's try to take some time to relax. Easier said than done, but that's what we have to do. Here's a neat fact for you. Since the fear response starts in the brain, a fun fact in general is that the human brain is just absolutely amazing. 86 billion neurons, which are connected by an estimated 100 trillion synapses. Those are the connection points between the neurons. That's more connections than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And you wanna know what I think is one of the most amazing facts that humans have ever uncovered? That is that everything you've ever seen, every painting you've ever appreciated, every song that you listened to and were moved by, every funeral that you went to and shed a tear, every baby that was born and you felt that protective instinct of that baby, every time you felt hungry, every time you felt thirsty, every time you created something, every time you pondered something, any time you solved an equation in math, all of it is just coming from these 100 trillion neurons or these connection points, 100 trillion connection points, 86 billion neurons in the brain. Our meat computer up here generated all of those uh, all of those emotions and all of that activity. That to me is absolutely stunning that everything that we've ever seen, interacted with, loved, cried about, hated, all comes from this little meat computer upstairs that we call a brain. So to wrap it all up, while it's technically possible to be scared to death, it's not the emotion of fear that actually kills anybody, but it's the intense psychological response to it. And it's almost always due to some sort of pre-existing condition, which the person may not even be aware of. Well, fellow humans, that wraps up our exploration of whether it's possible to be scared to death or not. We've laughed, we've cried, we've learned that while it's technically possible to be scared to death, it's about as likely as finding a unicorn in your backyard. I'd like to thank everybody for hanging out with me here today. Please drop me a line, let me know what you think, and remember, always stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.